All right, good morning and welcome. All right, my name is David Reese, and I am from Spyrac. And we're a Swedish started, now Australian engineering company that builds conveyors all over the world. So it's pronounced Spyrac, Spirox, Spirix, Spirix. No, you can't do it wrong. All over the world, they say it differently. Um, we're going to be talking about the incline conveyors and the live bottom conveyors, the conveyors in the live bottom hoppers. Uh, and we're a shaftless screw conveyor outfit, and there's a couple of things that are different about that. Feel free to interrupt me and ask questions as we go. We will have a question and answer period afterward, so if you like, you can save it for that. We're going to talk in general about Spirec, then do some safety stuff, then we'll talk about this specific installation and go through some of the O&M that survived the major coffee spill. <laughs> um, real quick background right now for Spyrek. About 25 years ago, a real smart guy in Sweden figured out how he could take some pretty special steel that they, they have available in Northern Europe and in bar form bend it the hard way and make a spring out of it that was just darn huge and turn it into a conveyor without a center shaft. Now, in order to do this, and I've had the pleasure of seeing the equipment that does it, they do it cold, and it's pretty doggone slick. It steam just flies off of it when they do it. But they're able to do it without causing any kind of fractures on the outside, without it causing any significant deformation difference between the inside and the outside, and it makes for a darn hard conveyor. Now, that's the trick. There are a lot of folks making spirals similar to ours, uh, mostly based in Northern Europe and Sweden. And as you surf the websites and check out who supplies this kind of stuff, they may build the troughs in the U.S. and we're beginning to, but the guts all seem to come from Northern Europe. The reason for that is that the steel is available there. It's a pretty special steel. It's called a microalloy steel. It's a high tensile microalloy steel and it's a specific grade and certification that can be used to make these spirals. Once you start shipping a big old heavy spiral like that across the ocean, it becomes pretty smart to go ahead and just wrap a trough around it. So that's why a lot of our stuff started in Sweden. Now due to some changes, our company is now being headquartered and run out of Perth, Australia. Uh, and our office, mine, is in Noonan, Georgia which is a lot of fun to deal with those guys because we're exactly 12 hours apart. So they're 8 a.m. is my 8 p.m., but we do all right. Um, they've done a lot of good things. Spyrek has been making these things for about 25 years. We hold the U.S. patent for the verticals. Uh, we do that just darn well. And it's a very reputable company. I think you guys are going to have some good life out of this equipment, and you'll really enjoy it. It's uh, very... You know, easy on maintenance and service. If you're accustomed to trying to deal with the bearings and the shafts and the belts, this will be a nice breath of fresh air for everyone. Having said all that, I'd like to show a video here that is primarily the first segment about Spyrac, and then you'll need to suffer through the second segment about safety. And here we one of the things that you saw is there are a number of different kinds of liners that we use. We use, uh, used to use an old white liner that was really good to check for wear. We moved to a black liner, which is similar to what you guys have in this application. And then the one that's now our standard is the Duraflow dual color liner. And that one's very beneficial in an outfit where you have, say, a long, long conveyor and you're worried about when that liner is going to wear out because there's no discharge chutes and you can't see an edge what happens is it turns a bright yellow as the red wears through and it allows you to plan your maintenance accordingly. We rarely if ever recommend spare parts for our equipment because the liners do last so long it makes little sense to have them on hand but they're also extremely hard so they're tough to store sometimes. I'm going to pass this around. This is the liner that's in your trough and it's pretty much hard as glass. It's got a heck of a memory to it so the spares that you'll have on hand will be put in a press break, formed into a U-shape, then banded so they'll retain that shape. If you ever snap the bands and have to replace the liners, 
we recommend you snap the bands last because it'll go back to flat. It really loves being flat, but it's hard, hard stuff and it stays in real well. The specs for your job, in addition to the configuration, required a very hard liner. We have an outfit in New York City that handles a lot of their sludge waste. Pretty much most of the waste from the city goes to the single point. They have a similar liner in use there. And many of you will be retired before you have to mess with these liners. It's been in service for about 10 years now. I believe it's 10 years and 8 months. And they have yet to replace the liners. Um, that's kind of cool if you're the maintenance guy. Go ahead and make sure everybody gets to see that. The other liners that we offer besides the dual color are a white liner and what we call a hard ox bar. And that's just hardened steel when folks have a lot of sand or gravel or grit that may cause some wear. Because as hard as that is, it is plastic. When we were doing the installation, the folks at uh, Allied Rigging had to do some welding for us. And you have to be careful when you're working on the troughs. If you're welding something, you can weld on that trough, grind it and weld it with the liner on the other side. But if you got a new guy or somebody taking their time with some beads of weld and he's going pass after pass after pass, you're going to deform the liner. It will melt. It will burn because it is plastic. But you can put a weld or two on there, do your normal maintenance, and you'll be fine. Does anybody have any general questions about Spiric? before I bore you to death with the safety portion and then talk about this installation. <coughs> and for those that don't know it or didn't hear it came in late, there are more donuts and donut holes. <coughs> Segment. And in order to do that, I don't want to pass out the O&M manual. What you have in your hands is a, just a typical lesson plan. I'll get that out and hit a few of the items that are on the safety portion. This is really good bathroom reading. This is not something you need to flip through as we're discussing stuff today, but it's great refresher for what we talked about, and it, it'll prompt you for if you have any questions for discussion amongst yourselves. As far as safety goes, those conveyors don't slow down, okay? and not a one a year or two a year or three years got enough fanny to stop one. So we really like to make sure folks that have good lockout tag outs really use them with conveyors. The big thing that we've accomplished with shaftless is to not have a center shaft. The center shaft that runs in a lot of the <coughs> conveyors, the screw conveyors, that auger piece would grab a screening or rag or something and just wrap it around the shaft, bundle it up, and block the whole works. Rarely would the conveyor stop because of what was wrapped around the shaft. And there's been some big honking stuff wrapped around those shafts. When those things are going, you don't want anybody opening the lid, looking at it, pointing, doing any kind of stuff. It is really kind of cool to have the lids off watching them run. I mean, it's like a screensaver. It's just kind of it's entrancing sometimes, but you don't want folks watching them. You know, we have lids that are clamped down on this job. Uh, we normally like to bolt them down, but uh, the clamp down's fine. It's very secure. But when the lids are open, the conveyors need to be off. And that's, that's fairly important. All kind of accidents can happen. Um, E-stop cables are not on these units to run alongside because of where they are and how they're configured. You've got some of your belt conveyors do have e-stop cables that run the length, and that's great for when they're open and somebody has a problem wants to stop it all of a sudden. For your equipment, the e-stops are on some buttons right there at floor level to turn off the, the conveyors. So again, that needs to be off, locked out, tagged out, <coughs> whenever somebody's working on it. The conveyors themselves are darn simple. It's just a screw in a trough. The only wear item that you have besides the screw is the liner. So there's not a lot of checks guys need to be making. And if you've got a guy that feels like he's got to climb all over it and touch and feel it, it needs to be locked out. Now, we'll go over a couple of the checks for maintenance next, but as we move away from having the lids on, 
these things run pretty quiet. So if you are walking by it one day and it's just kind of rumbling, that's fine. But if, if it's doing, doing anything like that, that's a problem. And there's a big difference between those two. I think you're going to find that as time goes by, it will run quieter and quieter and quieter. As it laps into those liners and it feels like it's at home, these things give good, reliable service to listen to. Anytime something goes wrong, likely you're going to hear it before you see it. There's all, all the reason in the world to not open those lids. Other issues for safety of course would be the electricals, the motors, these are on VFDs and the control panel is pretty far away. It's in what they're calling the northern control room. So one of the things we noticed during the startup is that the guys down in the pit on their radio or on their phone don't have great communication back to the control room because they're down in a hole and the reception's not that good. Just wanted to mention that so that everyone was extra aware of it. Need to be locked out, tagged out, and then verified because that's part of it. Any questions on that aspect at all? Let's talk about your conveyors. Okay, part of the handouts that I gave you is a teeny tiny drawing that you can't read to save your life. Uh, this is the O&M manual. It looks like this, and it should be available to everyone here who's going to service, work on, look at the equipment. There are two chapters for maintenance and servicing, four and five. Each one's about a page long, no big deal. The primary thing that we're gonna want you guys to look at is how tight stuff is and how much it might leak. These things shipped overseas. When I went and checked all the oil levels yesterday, there were a few loose bolts, loose plugs. Installation does that too. A lot of grinding and hammering and slagging and all kind of stuff, things can get loose. In the first month, the primary checks are to make sure things are tight. At the back end of this unit is a bell housing. And I've got, oh, just the messiest, yuckiest thing here. Let's talk about this in order. We'll go to starting this thing up. We've already started it up. They all look real good. They're running just fine. But you have some components that I need you to be aware of. They're outlined in the O&M manual. This right here is your drive. That's your gearbox and motor. And this right here is your trough. And right in between the two is what we call a bell housing. Similar to the bell housing on your car between the shifting gears and the engine, this is an open, dual flanged piece that has gland packing in it, rope gland packing, and a grease fitting. You cannot see it very well because it is also shielded as a finger protector for OSHA. At the end of the first month, and it's outlined in your O&M manual, this needs to be checked. It's about a half an hour job to check that. But the bolts need to be taken off, the shielding removed, and then there is a small lantern ring with three bolts. And you just want to snug them up lightly. If you see any visible leaking, it wouldn't be a bad idea to give it a shot of grease. But you just want to snug those up, especially on the inclines, to keep anything from coming back through the trough toward the drive. Now that's there for a couple of reasons. Number one, it protects the gearbox. We like to keep wet things away from the SCW gearboxes. SCW likes us to do that too. But the number two thing is so that you can check very easily kind of the condition of your, of your structure. That's the area where you're going to be able to do some doctor work. If you've got a lot of leaking there, if it's hot, if it just doesn't seem right, it's got black stuff, metal to metal, anything odd going on in your conveyor, 
you'll see it first at the bell housing. That's kind of the major attachment. You get fellas that have to have knee surgery at the age of 60, that's usually the first thing to go. So that's kind of the knee. The other item that we want everybody to look at in that first month is the gearbox. The conveyor, like I said, has just the spiral and the liner. If there's anything going to go wrong, it'll be in the thing with the most moving parts, and that's the gearbox. SEW Eurodrive sells an excellent gearbox. I like to say that they're probably the best, Nord probably second, and there's a laundry list beyond that. SEW has a, a terrific service center here in the LA area. They can turn around and repair in 24 hours. They're really super. But there's a lot of moving parts in that gearbox. In the first month, that's the time to be careful with it. Anything can happen during shipping or installation. Somebody can inadvertently check oil at the wrong place and drain half of it out. It just uses a standard gear oil. I've checked all your levels and they're all good right now. And all your breathers are good. But that gearbox is the second thing I'd like everybody to be aware of as a potential area that it, it, it would be a problem area if you're going to have one. The rest of the conveyor doesn't require a lot of checks other than condition and cleanliness. You want to make sure that it doesn't have any junk in it. Nobody's throwing wire and steel and things down in. When we did the inspection yesterday, prior to starting up, we're going to need to get the conveyor liners cleaned off. It did an awful lot of welding, a lot of grinding, and I believe they're installing some plastic on the inside of the hopper sections now. Austin Mac may be and that may be producing some more. But before those guys leave from being down in it, they're going to be vacuuming it out. If you go to start it up and it's got any kind of slag or steel grindings down in the bottom, that's a red flag. If you've got to do any service on a lid, a liner, the trough, and you have to grind, get that steel off of there. As good as that plastic liner is, and where is it? Once you rub steel across this with steel in between, it'll impregnate it into this liner, especially if it gets hot. And it'll just be like a, a piece of emery paper wearing down that spiral. So this thing needs to have steel cleaned off of it. That's pretty typical. That's the kiss of death for these liners, sand and steel. Anytime you do service on these things, Good idea to wash them out, clean them out real good. You never know what somebody's going to forget or leave down in it. At the bottom of the incline, there's a little two inch drain for clean out. Uh, I recommend shop backing out most of it and hose it off after. You're not going to hurt anything to hose it, but sometimes there will be a big old pile of dust and you, you don't want to clog up your drain right away. For the incline unit or for the live bottom units, there does not appear to be an access port, so it looks like maintenance will be on a ladder, but I cannot imagine anybody being down in it to do anything other than some major surgery. Just as a component of that surgery needs to be a good cleanup when they're done. Whenever there's a normal shutdown of the equipment, it's been designed so that it can run 100% trough, full, hard, filled. It's got some torque to it. But whenever you're going to shut it down for a long period of time, good idea to clean it out. Won't hurt a thing to get it clean. Never know how long they'll be down for. For typical shutdowns, you're going to be down for the weekend. Somebody's going to be doing maintenance on a downstream or upstream piece of equipment. Not that critical. Go ahead and shut it off. If you have anything in it that's got a high moisture content, it's just going to become easier to run as that moisture evaporates off. So not a big worry. You guys aren't doing a lot of lime slurry or anything heavy that's going to turn into concrete. So I'm not really concerned at all about that. Does anybody have any questions on anything to be concerned with for normal checks, start up or shut down? You said you're running those now. And did you were you able to go in there and inspect that there wasn't any steel in there, too? There is steel in there. So There's you, a couple of pieces of wire, a couple of pieces of junk that we want to get cleaned out. So you're not running them yet? You're waiting to clean them first? I thought you said you were running them already. We went ahead and ran them to check rotation, vibration, make sure everything was functioning properly, but there's no product. And I, I've asked Marco to make sure no product goes in and no extended runs occur 
okay. until all of that's cleaned out. So do you think we did put we compromise the liner then by running no, it with steel in there? No, I don't. I don't. I think right now it takes it takes a good hour to get things really jammed in there. Okay. Good half an hour. Good good running to really impregnate it. Likely a lot of it will push right on out to the discharge and just move it on down. As long as you're not just leaving it there, it'll be fine. When I looked at it, it had barely even worn the primer off of the steel. Okay. So it looks just fine. It'll move on with the paint. Um, one other mention about the liners. I'd, I'd said these things have a heck of a memory, and they're tight in that trough. You'll recall from the video that they're just held in place with two tabs. This is your trough, and this is your liner. They're about two inches long, a piece of quarter inch key stock welded on the sides, and these just pop in. I want to talk about the liner a little bit and some of the maintenance on it. As we all know, welds never break. Nothing ever goes wrong, and things don't come apart. Okay, haven't said that. Some welds break. If you do have an overload condition where these things have tripped, it doesn't feel like running today, something's making it knock off, please, please don't let anyone go over and just try to restart it and restart it and restart it. It will restart. It's pretty tough. But there are a few things to be aware of. If it trips, there's probably a good reason for it. Immediately take off all the lids and figure it out. These liners stay in place darn well. These weld tabs too. In the event that something heavy gets in it, from a Coke can to a piece of rebar, if it compromises this connection, gets in between and pops it out, the liner could shift. It is not unusual if something jars it or pries behind it to see a liner slide forward with the spiral. One of the things you guys have is a pushing incline toward a discharge, and if the liner is pushed up, it could blind the discharge. That would cause a condition where you're pretty much deadheading. It's not going anywhere. It's compacting, and it'll overload it, and it'll trip it. Pretty easy to see if that's the case just by opening it up, seeing if the discharge is clear. But if you continually go up there and try to restart it and restart it and restart it, something bad could happen. It could compress the spiral, damage the trough, or pop the lid off because they're pretty tough. What about if, a, if, that, if that keeper got knocked off a piece of rebar, like you said, if it chipped it off or something like that? It would try to flatten back out and put additional pressure on the spiral too, I would imagine. He's asking if the keeper got knocked off, what could happen? It, and it wouldn't want to flatten out, but it would rotate around the spiral as it ran. Okay. Um, that's actually how you replace the liner, is to pry it off that keeper, and it just rotates right around it. It's a fairly simple operation to replace a liner. But if that does come loose, you'll likely know it, because it'll make some noise and that liner will just go on down the line. So when you replace those, you knock the keeper off, open the doors, you and then run the shaft, and it actually lifts them out? You actually don't have to knock the keeper off. You take a pry bar, pretend this is the side of the trough, you take a pry bar or a big screwdriver, pry it off of that thing, you've got another person relieving the weight of the spiral. You do not have to lift it out of the trough just relieve the weight of it. Once that pops off of that keeper, you can physically push down, either with a rubber mallet and a piece of wood, but you can push it down and it'll roll around the spiral, and then you just lift it out. The new spiral liner comes in a U-shape. You pop the bands on it, lay it right on top of that, push it around, hammer it down, and it'll pop in there behind the keeper. Gotcha. Yes, sir. Typically, they're one meter apart. We put one at the front and the back of each liner set. The liners are a meter long, three feet long. We'll put a keeper here that is shared by the previous liner. 
and a keeper here that's shared with the next liner. A good pry bar is a big help. A good pry bar and a two by four. The maintenance on those liners. Um, I don't remember you ordering a two by four. Yeah. <laughs> Does not need to be metric. Yes, sir. <laughs> when the, the, the bear kicks out, did you run it backwards to remove any uh, stored energy in it? Or? Not particularly, no. You know, that's a good question. He's asking about the stored energy if you have one that's very compressed or compacted. You're not going to get a springiness to it. It'll deform. It'll put some stresses places. And certainly if you see the gates closed and the lid buckled, I'd be careful. But running it in reverse may actually do more damage than, than good. Yeah, I think I'd, I, I would not recommend it. One other thing to caution you all on, on that same line, is you guys have two discharges on the end of your inclines, and each one has a gate. Now there's a great big sign up there on the side of the controls for the gates that says one gate must be open at all times. You can imagine what would happen if both gates were closed. Normally, I we I thought have we put a a, um, a switch on that so that was impossible to. The gate had to be compatible with the line we're running. I think that was a change order. Is, did, is that not on there? To your I knowledge? don't know about that, and you and I can look into All it right. after. What we have is one gate here. This cylinder goes this way, and one gate here. This cylinder goes that way. One of these has to be open all the time signs on it all over the place. As you mentioned, there may even be a safety out there that prevents you from having them both in the closed position or open to the wrong line. <coughs> that was the that was that really the, something the concern the was there's there's too many too many decisions you have to make to, if you're running line 1 or line 2 and we wanted sure. to reduce that so we didn't have a big pile of material. And that may also be incorporated into the logic. Okay. Which was where I'd bet it would be. All right. Most folks attack it in the logic of their SCADA system or their PLCs. That's accurate. That's why we did it. Oh, okay. That's right. right. The limit um, switching won't allow it to, for instance, the lower shaft or the lower gate closes automatically when it is sent to the upper gate. Okay. So that one closes, so the material continues and dumps into the. That's upper perfect. Gate. <coughs> That's perfect. In normal operation, you should never have any trouble at all. If someone's doing anything in manual, there is a manual bypass on these gates. Be aware, we just don't want them both closed. If we if we ran it with both of them closed, what would you expect would happen? I would expect the motor would overload. Okay. I, I would expect the motor to Before overload. Before it pops the, pops the you thing apart? You have some thick troughs. Okay. Normally, the trough thickness that we see, that's spec'd for and asked for and that we provide as standard, is something like a 10 gauge you know, rarely very thick because the liner is doing all the work. In this particular case, probably because of where it's located, and you know, they really didn't want to worry about having to replace or fix a trough, these are quarter inch thick troughs. So they're going to last for a good long time. Okay. Yeah, I think that the motor would trip long before you'll have an issue. Okay. The only other thing that might happen is that lid pop. You know, the very end lid. Yeah, even that looks uh, like quarter inch and has some pretty well, hefty clamps on it. It's though. hinged with clamps. Yeah. And if and anything is going to go, it would be that yeah. clamp point. Okay. Any other questions about? Yes, sir. Since there's no bearing on the tail end of that screw, do the liners tend to wear out toward the tail end faster? That's, a, that's a great question. Where are the liners going to wear out? You're never going to see any liner wear right there by the drive. It's held up. You're going to get some scoring initially while it finds its home, but you won't see any liner wear. Where is your liner going to wear out the most? Let's say six years from now, you're just happy as can be with your spy rack equipment, but you're getting kind of nervous because you have to replace the liner. You do not need to worry about climbing down in that live bottom 
to look for excessive liner wear. However, the best place to look is right there or right there. You can see those places. You can open the lid from the catwalk and you can look in there. The spiral passes right over the top of them. There is the spiral and it stops here. There's no liner out there, it's just pushing it out into the discharge. You can see some wear at this point and some wear at this point. I believe this is a pretty good place too, but I would go to one of those. When you see the liner wear, and there's a, it's, it's really very much from plant to plant and application to application. When you replace them, it is a good idea to go ahead and gauge their running on the live bottom that fed them. So when I replace these liners in the incline, I would go ahead and plan to replace the liners in the live bottom that fed it. Likely this will be years from now, so it makes a lot of sense to do it all at once. One piece of equipment will be down, the one that feeds it could be serviced. But that's the best place to look for excessive wear. You'll also notice that when you get your look at this liner, there's your trough, and here's your spiral. It's not as big as the liner by a good half an inch, an inch. When it rotates, it's going to want to climb up that trough. So your liner wear will be off center, will be right there. How, how worn out can we let it go? I mean, we, we're you can let it, it go, go all the way through, right? You can let it go real worn out. Um, when it starts getting too close, we're going to risk. Uh, You'll Ooh. risk it popping out. That's a, that's a valid risk. We have some customers that wear it all the way through. Okay. Since you guys are mild steel, I would not recommend that. You wouldn't want to have to recoat it. Okay. Um, one of the things about the liner in this form, I can't bend it. If it's worn through to about an eighth of an inch, obviously I can. So as they wear, they become more fragile and it takes less and less to pop them out of the trough. That makes it real good for servicing a worn out liner, but it also gives you a little bit of a risk to say, let's go ahead and change that liner out. They asked for a, a liner that would stand some 100,000 hours, couple of few years, you'll get well over that for life for these. Any manual? other questions? Yes, sir. Does the manual give you a recommended uh, wear? Like, is it? It actually does not give you a recommended wear length okay. or distance or depth. Um, and one of the reasons for that is, you might have a spot right here on the nose that may wear clean through, and the rest of it be good. And in your judgment, you can tell that, well, it's just some product got in there one day and scraped it off. You know, we don't want to say we're not going to support your warranty unless you change it out when it's at least an eighth of an inch thick. Because sometimes that eighth of an inch could be a year or two. And that's real money for folks. Okay. So we let you guys make that decision. Any other questions about the liner or the spiral? Yes, sir. What kind of objects would we be concerned with getting in there that, that you've seen and experience that might one of those anything miles. long and hard we see we do a lot of facilities that uh, are sorting reclaiming or recycling mm -hmm. and it's amazing what folks will put in their goods to recycle them to get their weight up because they're typically paid by weight mm -hmm. um, the battery guys you know tires and newspapers they'll slip pieces of steel in between the sheets and that's just kiss of death um, four befores you can get uh, big old pieces of even wood, especially a hardwood, and they'll lift the spiral. Uh, you, you've just got to be careful. Each of the conveyors is designed specifically for what we plan for it to be moving. Um, we have conveyors that'll move some two befores and four before pieces, but they typically have a long pitch. They're designed for it. Uh, drifts. You get a lot of maintenance guys that carry around their own drifts, just a piece of steel, a piece of round steel, and they'll drop it down in there. The thing you want to keep from doing is having something hard 
that's going to lift the spiral or lift the liner. Those are the two things you want to run in sync. Think of it like a shaft in a bearing because the liner is our bearing and the spiral is our shaft. The better those can run together, the longer the life you're going to have. What's primarily going to be in this? Just the green waste and mulch? Well, some chunky wood. Be all right. But and probably pieces of two by four and pieces of four by four. But you I don't have see length being nah. a problem, and that's why what we're You to have do. a doubly reinforced spiral in each of these. Our standard spiral is one cross section with an intermediate or an insert welded inside it. Yes, sir. That's true, but uh, good. Just the green waste. Good. You you you'd be surprised what you can pick up occasionally from that. Stuff. If it's in the same plant, <laughs> it'll migrate there. You also have a reinforcing spiral on the back side. On your live bottoms, those are darn husky. They turn fairly slow. They'll last a while. On the inclines, you have in addition to the normal spiral and a big insert. You also have an outer spiral because of the incline to keep it nice and firmly seated within the diameter of that trough. So these are pretty tough spirals. They ought to be able to handle an awful yeah. lot. Matter of fact, as I recall, that may have been part of the spec, the strength of the overall spiral. These are pretty tough. The weak link on the spiral is where it's connected to the drive. So if you're going to have a problem, start looking there first. I have yet to see a spiral deform, twist, or break in the years that I've been servicing, designing, and training for these things. Any warranty issues we've had, it's been very quick to see a great big piece of steel get in there. So uh, I'm with your product, I'm optimistic you'll have some great life out of these. Any other questions on the normal operation or anything to worry about? Are there any issues with water to worry about? You may. If you have a high moisture content, you're going to end up really making that gland packing work at the bell housing. Your inclines have a two inch drain at the bottom. That is, if everything's running, something that may work. But if it stops and starts and stops and starts, it's going to fill up with some solid stuff pretty quick. So it is primarily just for clean out. Uh, we do have outfits sometimes that run a wet product and they'll build up a puddle down here and it'll get deeper and deeper. So depending on your product, if you run a lot of things with high moisture content, you may want to go in and clean that out every now and then. Your live bottoms don't have that kind of a drain. They push everything right out into the inclines. So that's a good question about the moisture. If you see any big leaking around the plate that connects this, in addition to making sure the plate is tight, it would be good to open that lid and see if you don't just have a big old puddle in there. Puddle's not going to hurt anything with the spiral, but like you say, it will make that gland packing work awful hard. So the drain is open, typically open. There's well, not a plug no, there. There's a pipe plug on it right oh, now. Okay. Yeah, right now it's it's just a two-inch drain with a pipe plug. Okay. And as I understand it, it's to be used for clean out, servicing. But you know, if you've got a place to put it, you might want to put a hose and a valve on it. Yeah. If you have a place to put it. Otherwise, I would relegate it to clean out. You now, if you have one of the hoppers or all of them that are going to run a high moisture content, or you have a nuisance problem may want to pipe it to drain. Yeah. That'd be just kind of, you'll have to make that call as you run. Okay. So let's say we were running, I don't know if you're familiar with biosolids, you probably are, but it, like biosolids through there and we just left that, took the pipe plug off of that mm -hmm. and just left it open, would, would it end up pushing the biosolids out through that drain hole? No, it likely would not. Uh, the biosolids would likely just plug it up. Because don't forget, 
it's not just the hole in the quarter inch trough. You've got, and the question was regarding plugging that hole if it were left open. You've got a trough that's a quarter of an inch thick, you've got a liner that's a half an inch thick, and you've got a two inch hole. And obviously that's not to scale. This hole right here would likely plug up with some solid stuff pretty quick. But the pressure of the solids passing by wouldn't ooze out the... Nope, pushing that way. Because the point is, if we, if we do, if we're, we're planning on washing possibly into these things somewhat, not a tremendous amount of water, but mm -hmm. a little bit. And if, if the hole could, be remain, could remain open, and like you said, plumb to the drain or something, that might be desirable. However, if it's just going to simply plug up with biosolids, that wouldn't do it any good, I wouldn't think. I would tend to agree with you. Okay. So we right would have now, to physically go lock it out and poke it through or something and release the water. Something like that, probably. If a guy's got a hose down there, you blow once it, it rotates around, he can open the lid and pew, shoot it out, too. In operation, though, where's the water going to want to go? Where's that water going to The water typically would carry, the, would, the biosolids would sort of bridge it up, I would think, and it would pass along, is what my hope was. And that's what I would suspect, because where would it pocket? I mean, the biosolids would fill that space. There would be no void there. It would be full of product. Full of solids. So it wouldn't really be allowed to collect water there, I wouldn't think. Depending on where the hole's located to the corner, because you got the bell housing attaching down that end. Yeah. There might be a corner that the spiral's not cleanly. Here's Agreed, but that would fill up with biosolids. Right, right. And it wouldn't allow water to puddle there, I wouldn't think. There's your spiral there. Your spiral has to actually physically turn. When you look at your coupling disc, it's a half moon bolt here and a bolt here to hold the spiral on. You can't see the hole well when the spiral is turned to where this part is down over the hole. Sure. It's actually behind the physical plate of the spiral. The area here should stay clear of buildup under normal operation, but over time, all kind of dust, dirt, and fallback are going to come in there. So water could collect there? Water could collect there. Okay. Yeah. So we'll have to inspect that and see what that will need to be, one of them already is full of welding slag. Okay. And it's, you know, it's been capped, so certainly it just filled up. Okay. It is a good place to make a change or an add. You know, you can either put a pipe on it or routinely flush it. Now the detailed O&M that goes with this equipment will give you fairly straightforward instructions on replacing the gland packing or replacing the liner or welding in the tabs. Um, none of them is super complex. You guys have been working on conveying equipment for a while and the maintenance for a shaftless screw conveyor is a whole lot less complex than for a belt or for a shafted unit. Uh, the liners as we'd mentioned earlier, a meter long, three feet long. The lids are typically four feet long, five feet long, longer than the liner. That way it's easy to pull it out. You don't have to do a lot of monkeying around. Any other questions at all on maintenance and servicing of this equipment? Has everyone in the room been out to see the equipment? Yes? Okay. It looks like you have good accessibility to the incline, except for the nose of it. But it doesn't look like a huge requirement to get on that nose unless you have a problem. The only item that we haven't checked out are the slide gates. We're planning on trying to get some power on them today so we can do it. But the rest of it runs quietly and runs well. If you ever have any trouble with spiric equipment, like I had said early in this, It'll be in noise, it'll be in sound, and they ought to run really well. As soon as they get some product in it, they run real quiet. Is this Rockwell Engineering Company in Tustin, do they have uh, field service folks? They do. Okay. And as a matter of fact, I'll get with you guys after the class, you and Mike. Our rep in this area has changed for this specific equipment. If there's any issues, it would be Rockwell but flow systems, and I have the new contact information, is our new rep in this area. Okay. Thank you all for your time. Please eat these donuts before you go.
I'm going to go out to the equipment. I've got some pictures I would like to take. If anyone would like to go out there with me, we can point, ask questions, and answer questions for as long as you like. My flight doesn't leave till 4, so I'm just going to be here most of the day. Thank you again. Thank you. Uh, let's walk over and look in them. Um, uh, we've got basically two components that Spiric is a part of. The live bottoms of the hoppers and the inclines that take the product away from the live bottoms. So you can see them over here. Let's go to the very last one because they're starting to put the liner in and you can see it. In order to look inside these, they've got this manual hand crank, which I am not going to crank, but it basically allows you to lift that up so that the guys can see inside, make sure everything's groovy. You can see the steel slag that's down in these that needs to be cleaned out amongst all the spirals. This liner is what Austin Mack is doing to finish up their hopper portion. Those spirals are left-right, meaning they're kind of side-by-side in pairs. So as they run, they prevent bridging of the product. They're kind of pouring it on each other. That's the coupling disc down at that end on the right. And you'll notice that the pushing face is the smooth, flat face. The reinforcing steel is behind it. These bars that are on the end that run across, we call them anti-lift bars, and they prevent, in the event of clumpy solids or big solids, those spirals from lifting up as they go out and discharge product. Those bars are there just to keep that spiral in the bottom of the trough. And this is a pretty good shot showing these two hoppers are both delivering product into this middle section. This is the area where it's discharging down into the verticals. If a man's walking on this catwalk, he can easily reach over, grab a handle, undo a clamp, and open and look in those lids. The lids are all clamped shut. The hinges are opposite of the catwalk. If you look down at the nose of the conveyors, you can see that the last slide gate is a perpendicular slide gate, meaning that the actuator pulls it open and pushes it closed perpendicular to the direction of travel. You cannot see the cylinders for the slide gate above that first tubed conveyor because it's underneath the conveyor running back toward us. Straight down is the first square lid. We'll go downstairs and look in it, but that's the best place to start when looking for any troubleshooting. You can lift that first lid and see the spiral drive coupling. Look at the bell housing, it's all right there. Okay, this is the big incline. Right here is your e-stop for the incline. And certainly, if someone has a problem and needs to e-stop the incline, they need to be e-stopping the live bin so it'll quit feeding it. That's why these are side by side. In addition to the SCADA system as the uh, controller for not having two gates closed, this is the sign that we were talking about warning that even in manual operation we needed to have a gate open. This is a fairly straightforward control system for the inclines. Both I would. I would. I definitely would. If you have someone who has occasion, and he's down here for example, and here's a terrible rumbling coming from the live bottom, and he feels it's, it's significant enough to check it out, and he wants to e-stop the live bottom, he can wait until the e incline is run dry and it's moved product out. Keep him from having a great big mess when he's trying to figure out what the, the issue is, and then e-stop that one. However, if it's the reverse, if there's a terrible noise coming from the incline, you'll want to hit them both to keep it from being fed further. Uh, let's go over here because you can see this one better. This is simply the power box to the motors 
for the, the live bottom. Same thing here. Now this, well, you, you may have to squirrel in here and look at the trough just to show them the drain. This is that two inch drain line down here. And it's really just a capped piece of pipe. Huh. Okay. So it's kind of your discretion what you want to do with that thing. Well, we'll, we'll have to figure out what, you know, what we need it for. I mean, at first we'll, you know, we'll test it. If it's a significant amount of volume, we'll pipe it. You uh, honestly may not need it. We might not. The more I think about it, if you've got a material that would tend to wick out moisture, it'll carry it on out. That's what I'm thinking. You know, yeah, I, I just don't believe you're going to have a big issue with that. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. I, I can't see how it would let it go no. go behind it. I think that would act as a, as a sweeper and just grab it and take it up. Now, let's get a shot, come on back over, of this, this, and this. This here is your bell housing assembly with its finger guard in place. It has a grease fitting. They've all been shot with grease. They've all been snugged up for initial start. But this is the shield that will need to be removed after that first month of running. Let them run. Let them feel happy where they are so that they can check the tightness of the, of the gland packing and the, and the lantern ring. There's a nice procedure in the O&M for it. But it does take them 20 minutes to a half an hour to do that. Does the old manual talk about uh, operating temperature of the gearbox? Well, it talks about it. It says use a heat gun, right. don't use your hand, and stuff like that. But you're going to be able to tell because you have three units within walking distance of each other. So your maintenance guys are going to know if they have a problem because this guy's going to be real hot and shaking and that guy's going to be quiet. So they'll have a good idea. A lot of them, they'll run nice and warm. You shouldn't be able to burn your hand. No way. All right. But they tell you. I would you, hope not. That's a lot of steel to heat up that hot. It is. They tell you not to use your hand in the manual just because. I understand. If you have a problem, it's going to be real hot. Anyway, anyway. Well, we have a heat gun. So. Anyway, this is the SCW gearbox. These are FAZ 127s. It's one of the larger ones they sell. It's a good, good gearbox. If it's going to have a problem, it will be here. This is the adapter that connects it to the motor. SEW Eurodrive is a European company. They do not get involved in explosion proof stuff. All of their motors they normally sell bolt right on up to this face, which is not a MEMA C face. It's just their regular old SEW. So when they sell in America or Canada or any place explosion proof, they have to have this adapter right here. And it's, it's basically this, both of these pieces. Well, that thing's really hanging out there. It is. Are that going to be a problem? Nah, no, those are, those are tough. Okay. And those are zinging away, okay. nice sewing machine. You'll see a little bit of a, I mean, if you put your hand on it, you might can feel it, especially until you get product in there and that spiral settles down. When the spiral sees some product and some resistance, it just gets nice and comfortable and in the groove. But when it's empty, it'll be doing this, kind of running around. Okay. You may hear something like a, uh, Oh, what's a good description? If you take uh, steel on rubber and go brrrr, and just kind of rub your finger on it to where it just chatters, you may hear some of that during run-in because the liner is formed in a press brake. So it has a bunch of flats on the bottom. And the spiral as it's turning wants to climb up the liner and then slide back down and then climb up and slide back down. Okay. So you may get a chattery sound, especially again until you get product in it. It looks a lot like the bottom of the trough. Yes, it does. Okay. And as a matter of fact, why don't we go up the steps so you can get a shot inside the troughs. Are you going to spin these today? No, we did them all yesterday. All right. I think that uh, Ken, the electrician, uh, I think his name's Ken. Yeah. Ken Bishop. Yes. Ken Bishop. Um, he had some things to jump around with the PLCs or the controls in that control room to where he had to be on site and physically make each one of them yeah, go. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. I'd love it if we could run product while I'm here, but I, I think we're a ways away from that. Yep. And this is the spiral. It'll lay back. There we go. I'll let the camera, uh, once you come up here and go back down for the camera, you'll notice the spiral is held on with two bolts. And we get asked all the time if those are shear bolts and if they break off when there's a, they're not. Uh, there are some spiral companies and manufacturers that try to do that. 
but depending on how tight your maintenance guy tightens a bolt is going to change the shear effect. So we, we don't rely on that at all. Those are not shear bolts. Um, maintenance. You can see your drain hole from here and how it's partially filled with some dried stuff. You can also see some of the dust and dirt in the bottom. Yeah. You can see it more up here where we've run it and moved it up. Go ahead. You go ahead and lay it back. Did you hear any of the maintenance stuff? Yeah. yeah. Well, sometimes they will. See this oh, slag here? Yeah. The steel dust from the slag? Really need that shot backed out. You know, that's what it seemed like. Okay. Good. Uh, gosh, that would be kissing death. Oh, I bet. Well, you know, they've got to get down inside these hoppers anyway for that liner. Perfect time to back it out. Yes, sir. You said that these were the best points to check for liner wear. Right, right here. Right here. Look in here and look that way. This is really the best place. Well, you can't really see it. I guess that one. Yep. Which is really kind of silly. But I guess they had to end it somewhere. But looking in at a discharge, best place to look. Now, they'll need to check that liner wear every three to six months. So it's not like a daily check. Now, here's the other thing that I was mentioning. You can't see that drain with the position of that spiral right now. Yep. So that's going to help keep it from building up a lot of that junk down there. That means it's going to be wiped. Oh, yeah. yeah. Very well. You can even see where it's hitting that liner. And I don't when, know why the biosolids would meander back this way. I mean, it may, you know, if it, if it just doesn't when it's sweep not the water up with it and water escapes by, we might be able to just leave that open with a, like you said, a hose or a bucket or something. You, you very well may. Again, you're going to have to do it a case at a time. These are good spirals, though. Man, that's a husky spiral. In Europe, they laugh at us. Yeah, you know what? They did a lot of that stuff overkill here because then we can always transform this place over to a cement plant if we need to. Or an aggregate. aggregate you probably plant. can here. You know what I mean? Give you some steel liners yeah, to pop in. This is solids at 1,600 pounds a yard and, and some wood at 500 pounds a yard. And this stuff looks like it could be held three quarter inch aggregate up here. Yeah, these could, make, uh, these could be mixers. Uh, let's get a shot between at the small motors. Yes, sir. You got to go in here to reset it when they go out on over torque. Does it actually trip the heaters or are there torque switches? They've got an overload scale in the SCADA system. The SCADA system, as I understand it, is going to be monitoring the amperage, the yes. load. So the SCADA system would be the first place to trip off. Now, also in the room, you'll get an indication of whether or not the thermal's tripped in here. But is this where you reset it? If the SCADA does its job, you shouldn't have to go in here. Right. You know, but if it's an event, like say something that's pretty sudden, it may not have the response time on it and that may trip right off. Additionally, you never know what's gonna happen. But I think the SCADA, the way he's got it set up, is fairly good at telling you where your problem is. He could tell us yesterday, you got an e-stop in, you got an overload that looks tripped, and the power was off at the panel and the e-stop was tripped on one of the others. So it'll, it'll designate where to go. It looks like a pretty good system. Okay, these are the inverter driven motors. Not sure how your speed is gonna be controlled, whether it's just gonna be set we set the speed of the biosolids hoppers. We're going to okay. run one of these at a time. So we choose a line and a hopper, and we and we set a speed, uh, and that's confirmed by a scale on the belt. Ah, good. Okay. So good. 50 ton an hour, say. Sure. And then calibrate. That, yeah, that will adjust these VFDs to run at 50 ton an hour. Good. And then we have a ratio uh, uh, controller. So we pick a ratio, say one ton to one ton, and then that automatically controls variable uh, augers out of the amendments and that's also verified by the belt scales okay good that's how it works one thing to note on these motors and gearboxes here is that just as you saw there was a gearbox an adapter and a motor for the inclines here you have a gearbox and a gearbox 
and an adapter and a motor. It has a double reduction gear unit. So there are actually three components in addition to the motor. You have a gearbox, a smaller gearbox for a second reduction, and then the AM adapter. So you have three units up there. That'll help the maintenance guys in their troubleshooting. If you hear a noise coming out of that, I'd recommend start from the motor and work that way rather than start from the gearbox and working down. What is that? What's the? Is that just a seal right there? Is that a coupler or what is, what's under that band? That's the same type of a coupling as you have on the inclines. That band is surrounding the bell housing we were talking about that'll take about a half an hour, 20 minutes after the first month, after it runs for a while, to open it up, check that lantern ring, make sure it's all set up fine. And that O&M manual calls for 30 days after operation to go and do this process. It's got a monthly check, and then it says six months, and then uh, annually. Yes, sir. Longer. Yes, sir. If something should happen, we'd have to pull that out. How would you pull it out? Well, that kind of depends. For the live bottoms, it's no big deal. You'd unbolt it and lift it up. For these here, let's look at it and let's talk through it, okay? Let's, let's go look at this one. When you do any servicing with some of these big augers, if you don't have a crane or something available, you're gonna dice it up to pull it out anyway. Yeah, but how would you get the new one back there? Weld it in place. Oh, okay. Yeah, they're pretty easy to do it that way too. Really? Yeah, I really recommend if somebody's gonna put in a big long one, that they weld it in the trough. One reason for that is that the trough lines it up. Okay. What they'll do, and see these are all so easily yeah. cut out, they're not the big angle iron ones. If you wanted to remove this spiral, you'd have two choices. First choice is to undo the two bolts down at the end, cut all of these out, well, lift it out, bring it out, and then bring it up and out. I wouldn't do it that way. <laughs> Second choice is to cut a couple of these out and cut the spiral. When these are worn, and it'll be, it'll be ten years. Okay, after I retire. It'll be. Oh yeah, yeah. You'll be. You'll be out of here. So how do you put the new one in? Same way. You do it in sections. All right. You put a new one in the bottom first. Usually, you'll just have this gone. Lower it in drive plate down first. Lay it in. Slide it on down. You take some angle iron and wedge it on both sides of the spot. Take your next piece and bring it down and lace it up there. Take some angle iron, wedge it on both sides so that the spiral's nice and tight. Weld it together with a good butt weld. There's a welding procedure in Chapter 4 of the O&M. Give it a good butt weld, grind it off real good, clean it up and go. Most folks prefer to assemble the spirals in the trough. And stuff like that's probably not the best stuff. So if we ordered a new, a new spiral, it wouldn't come in one piece, it'd come in sections um, anyway? Not unless you wanted it in one piece. We would put it in one piece if you had something like the live bottom. Okay. Those can come out and go in in one piece. So I'd you know get the exact length and send it to you. Okay. Something like this, you know, if you guys came up with a clever way to replace it in one piece, I'd send it to you in one piece. Well, you can probably remove this type of stuff. Yep. Yeah. Shouldn't that be more than welding that spiral up? Yeah. Welding the spiral up is time consuming, but it's a whole lot easier than you think. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir.